Okay, so welcome to the last Heidelberg Journal Colloquium from me uh, this semester. And uh, so it's a great pleasure for me to um, introduce Eric Phil Hopkins from Caltech. Uh, so he um, did his uh, PhD in Harvard in 2008 with a large number. And then uh, had oh, feedback, right? And then uh, had uh, a Miller Fellow and an Einstein Fellow at, uh, at Berkeley, after which in the last year he moved uh, to, to Caltech to, pick up, to take up a assistant professorship, a tenured professorship at uh, Caltech. Um, so Phil is, uh, is uh, known for uh, his numerical skills and also his width and breadth of, the, uh, of his uh, works, working also on galaxies but also on planet formation. Uh, so today, we will talk about um, galaxies and uh, so the uh, feedback in galaxies. And so, looking forward to hear your talk. Thank you. Um, is, this on? is this on? There we go. Okay. Um, all right. Great. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you all for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, uh, get a chance to stay a few extra days and actually catch up with uh, more people here. Uh, although I still feel like there's. 50 of you that I wanted to talk to and haven't really had a chance to. Um, so hopefully I'll have an excuse to come back soon and uh, talk more. But I'm around for the rest of the afternoon, uh, so please come grab me after the talk. I have to head out tomorrow uh, uh, if you want to ask anything. Um, so I'm going to talk today uh, on work on the formation of galaxies and stars and galaxies, uh, which has, uh, is generally uh, uh, generously said uh, is, is one of a few areas I've been interested in lately, but it's probably what uh, most of my, my time and effort has been, been thinking about, along with a, a fairly large group of collaborators uh, who aren't listed here, but I'll uh, show their work throughout the talk. In particular, I want to point out uh, work by Jose Norbe, who's here, uh, Sasha Muratov at UCSD, uh, Freika Vandenborg at Berkeley, um, as well as uh, a couple of graduate students, uh, Sheng Cheng Ma, Lena Murchikova, uh, and a number of others who uh, I'll show you results from. Uh, this is a collaboration we're calling the FIRE Collaboration for Feedback in Realistic Environments, uh, because nowadays even your simulations have to have cheesy acronyms if you want to write proposals and get funded. Um, but the, the motivation has really been to try and understand uh, the links between star formation and galaxy formation in a more predictive way and to really try and tie together those two fields uh, in a way that is just becoming possible uh, recently. And I, I'll give you more of a flavor of what I mean by that, and in the process, try and give you a broad overview of some of the questions we're interested in. So, okay, this is obvious. When we talk about galaxy formation, this is sort of the question we're trying to solve. How do we get from the Big Bang uh, to the Milky Way? By from the Big Bang, I really mean from the CMB, where we have at least a statistically pretty good description of the universe this time, and today, where we have exquisite observations. Um, we have a framework, of course, that we hang this on, and that's made the job of galaxy formation much easier, that there's at least some convergence in the cosmology. So the idea is, of course, that these small structures grow under the influence of self-gravity, collapse, form these virialized dark matter halos, but then assemble hierarchically. That was just a quick a uh, video from a simulation by Andrei Krasov of the formation of a local group type uh, uh, system. And you know, this is a part of the story we're all very familiar with. Um, and that part is relatively easy, maybe just because we don't understand the dark matter, so we put it in super simply, but we can do gravity. Uh, but that's a long way away from these beautiful galaxies that we see today. And it's there where you start running into the problems. It's when you put the baryons in, that suddenly this beautiful picture that explains so successfully the large-scale structure of the universe starts to, to fall apart. So if you ask me what the biggest single problem in galaxy and star formation is, I, in my very biased uh, uh, sense, would reply, why is star formation so inefficient? That's the biggest question to me. And star formation is inefficient in at least two senses, uh, and this is important in both the star formation and the galaxy formation communities. So in one sense, star formation is inefficient in the sense that it's slow. And that's what's shown here. This is a famous Schmidt-Kennicutt uh, Schmidt relation, observed relation between the density of star formation in the galaxy 
and the density of gas, or in this case, density of gas divided by dynamical time. So the problem is, you put your galaxy, uh, you put your cosmology into your simulation. You, th you say, okay, I know the initial conditions, I know how to describe gravity, I know how to do the chemistry, so I can follow radiative cooling, and I'm going to say that you know gas will eventually cool down, get dense, and form stars. And the, what you get as your answer is that the the, the inescapable conclusion from that model is that gas can cool fast. It can cool fast in galaxies compared to the dynamical time, which means it collapses basically on a free fall time to essentially arbitrarily high densities. And once it's at those arbitrarily high densities, it's eventually going to turn into stars. And so naively, your theorist prediction is provided the gas can cool, which chemistry says it can, the star formation rate should be the gas mass divided by the dynamical time, because that's the rate at which gas is collapsing to arbitrarily high densities. And this relationship empirically shows this nice correlation that has more or less the slope you'd naively predict, except the normalization is wrong by a factor of 50. You turn 1 or 2% of the stars, of the gas in the galaxy into stars every dynamical time, not all of it. So why is star formation so inefficient in that sense? But star formation is inefficient in a second sense. So say that I didn't care what was happening inside of galaxies, and I said, okay, some physics suppresses the efficiency of star formation. Star formation is slow, I'll grant you that. And I'm just going to force it to be slow on my cosmological scales. So now I put in a little bit of subgrid physics in my cosmological simulation. I say I follow gravity, I follow cooling, and once it's in the galaxy, I force it to slowly turn into stars, rather than letting it collapse on its own freefall time. And I just force this relation to be obeyed. What do I predict? integrated over the life of the universe, I've made into stars. Well, this is the prediction. This is the mass function of galaxies. The number density is a function of their mass in stars. And this red line is what you end up predicting when you run that model forward, which is basically that all the baryons in the universe, or or unity fraction of all the baryons in the universe, are now in stars. And the problem is the Hubble time is a lot longer than a galaxy dynamical time. So once it gets into the galaxy, you don't care that it's slow inside the galaxy, it's still going to eventually turn into stars. So the only way out of this is to say that a bunch of these baryons didn't get into galaxies or somehow got out of galaxies after they got into them. Because what you want is to move this red line down to this observed relationship. Now, a more intuitive or, or perhaps a uh, useful way of plotting this that, that gives you some insight into the problem we're trying to solve here is this. This is essentially the same information. This is plotting the ratio of the stellar mass of the central galaxy in a dark matter halo to its halo mass as a function of that halo mass, from work by Ben Moster. These are the empirical constraints in the shaded range. And the dashed line, just to point out to you, shows what would, where you'd live if you turn 10% of the universal baryon supply aka the supply of baryons you expect the halo to drag in just with gravity into stars. What you can see is even at the Milky Way mass, which is about the peak of this, uh, uh, the L star of the galaxy luminosity function, you've only turned about 20% of the available baryons into stars. So even at that mass, which is by far and away where this peaks, star formation is quite inefficient, and it drops like a rock at both lower and higher masses. And I show this in part to emphasize that this is a, a tremendous uncertainty and, and big problem for our models. This is not you know, details of a factor of a couple that we have to understand. This is two and three order of magnitude discrepancies between our naive theoretical expectation and the observations. When both we talk about dwarfs and massive galaxies. So the idea has been around for a long time that the way out of this is from feedback by stars, in particular at the low mass end. The idea is, okay, these things are tiny little halos, they have shallow potential wells, I form some stars, supernovae explode after a little bit of time, and they just unbind most of the gas, because they're living in this very shallow potential well. It all gets blown out, star formation is done, problem solved. Now, I'm going to show you in a minute why we're still talking about this 40 years after this idea was originally proposed. It's not that simple. Uh, and it's been actually an incredible challenge to get that idea to make any sense. At the high mass end, even if you buy that stellar feedback explains the inefficiency of star formation in dwarf galaxies, it doesn't work anymore at high masses for at least a couple of reasons. One is that these galaxies aren't 
uh, empirically forming stars at any significant rate. And another is that their potential wells are just too deep. Uh, the, even a direct ejecta from a supernova might not be able to escape the most extreme uh, examples of these. And that's where we think that maybe feedback from supermassive black holes, more speculatively, is what's driving things. And I'll come back to this at the end of my talk. Uh, I won't have time to get into it. It's really a talk in and of itself, but I'll give you a brief flavor of uh, what we're doing uh, and what many people in the field are thinking about in that area. All right, so let's start with small galaxies. Why is this so hard? Okay, feedback's the key, so why don't we just do this? Well, okay, what are the ingredients now that we need? We need gravity. Good, we know how to do gravity. We can do that uh, easily. We can put it in our simulations. We can even treat it analytically. It's great. We need hydrodynamics and magnetic fields. Okay, we can, you know, put those in too. It's harder, but we can do it, and we know the equations to put in. We need the chemistry and the cooling physics. Okay, we don't know all the details, but we can put in not terrible approximations for that. Well, then we have to put in this mysterious feedback, and that's where everything falls apart. So historically, when people have simulated galaxy formation, the way they've treated feedback from stars is incredibly simplistic. And this partly owes to resolution limitations, and I think partly it's just lack of communication between people working on stars and people working on galaxies. Uh, so this standard treatment has been to say, okay, I formed some stars, some fraction of those stars explode as supernovae, a supernova releases order 10 to the 51 ergs uh, uh, per event, so I just dump that back into my medium as thermal energy, and there is my feedback cycle. And when you do this, it's a disaster. It doesn't do anything. And the problem is, you can convince yourself pretty easily, and many people have, that you just radiate away that energy very, very quickly. So this is just an illustration of some numbers uh, you can change them depending on the detailed conditions, but here I've just assumed a supernova goes off inside a GMC, that it's sort of, and then it expands to sort of mean ISM densities, and at those mean densities, the cooling time is something like a few thousand, maybe 10,000 years, whereas the dynamical time is 10 to the 7 and 10 to the 8 years. So as far as the dynamical collapse of the medium is concerned, it's this collapse on its own freefall time, Supernova dumps a bunch of thermal energy into the medium, it radiates it away instantaneously, and ceases to care that the supernova ever occurred. So if you have to dissolve the multi-phase ISM, right? I mean, N should not be 1 cc in this case, it should be much lower if there's a hospital. Well, I, I think that's certainly part of it. You want to, you know, part of this is because of lack of resolution of a multi-phase ISM. You want to be dumping this energy into a much more diffuse, hot uh, medium. But I'd argue that part of it is also that it's just not actually thermal energy that's always doing all the work. It's also that you're ignoring the momentum terms in these equations, right? It doesn't dissipate so easily. But that's absolutely a big part of it, of course. So, and that's going to motivate the, the work I'm going to describe. Um, so when you do that, not surprisingly, in a lower resolution simulation, it doesn't save you. And that's just illustrated here in a simulation by Piontek and Steinmetz. This is following the formation of a Milky Way mass galaxy over cosmic time. The observed star formation history should be something relatively flat uh, and low. And the black line shows what happens with no feedback. Everything cools, falls in on a dynamical time, bursts into stars. And then they just do this simple supernova heating, and everything falls in, cools, collapses on a dynamical time, bursts into stars. Maybe you stave it off for a tiny bit of time, but it really doesn't help you at all. So traditionally, we get around this by cheating or putting in our subgrid models in one of a couple ways. And you know, this is certainly something I've done as much as anybody else. So uh, I'm not trying to, to point out any, you know, I'm not trying to poke fun at the, the exercise here, but I'm trying to motivate why you want to, to look further. So you either typically deal with this by turning off cooling. You say, I want this heat to do something. So one way to do that is to force it not to cool. But I want to emphasize that for that to work, you need to turn off cooling for an order of the galaxy dynamical time, for it to actually generate outflows on a galactic scale, which typically means you're turning off cooling for something like a thousand times the physical cooling time of the gas. So again, not a small correction. You're not going to explain this with doing the chemistry slightly wrong in those regions, for example. The other option is just to say, OK, I don't understand the generation of these winds, I'm just going to say that I only care about their effects on larger scales, so I'm just going to assume they exist. A more semi-analytic approach where you say, all right, for every unit stars I form, I throw out some unit mass from the galaxy. And then 
Of course, at that point, you can't actually study the generation of these winds. You'd sort of bypass this question. But maybe that lets you study things on larger scales. And I think there's a lot you can do with that approach, but I'm going to try and highlight in this talk some areas where, even on very large scales, that might not be accurate enough. And you might run into problems with that uh, simple assumption. So, okay, how can we do better? Well, the main goal of this simulation project has been to try and improve on this by sort of building up from small scales, ISM scale, galaxy scale simulations, and now cosmological scale simulations to try and uh, resolve more of this physics. So, what's the, the first reason we can do this? Well, not because we're smarter than the very, very smart people who worked on this problem, but a key enabling factor is simply Moore's Law, that it's now possible to run simulations with the kind of resolution needed to treat explicitly a multi-phase interstellar medium. So it's now possible to run a cosmological or galaxy scale simulation with few parsec resolution. And at that point, it becomes physically meaningful to talk about resolving the formation of a giant molecular cloud. So you put in the relevant cooling physics that you have, cold gas, and it also becomes possible to restrict the sites of star formation to very dense gas. Of course, you're not resolving the sites of individual protostars forming in these simulations. You still have to put in some rule for how stars form. But you can say, I'll only allow stars to form in, for example, the simulations here, at densities above 100 particles per cubic centimeter, which restricts them not just to, gen to, D to GMCs, but actually off into the denser subregions of GMCs. So you're starting to talk about stars forming in the right places and in things like a physically clustered manner uh, being resolved in your simulations. And then once you form a star, you say, OK, if I'm going to try and do this explicitly, I'm not going to say that my feedback model is some unknown average over processes I can't resolve. I'm going to just put in what I know should be there. So you take every star particle with a known age, mass, metallicity, and you put it into Starburst 99 or whatever your favorite stellar population model is, and you say, here's the supernova rate as a function of time. Here's the amount of mass loss in stellar winds. Here's the associated metal uh, loss. Here's the associated momentum energy injection. Here's the rate of production of, photo ion uh, of ionizing photons. And you use that to calculate the H2 regions of the photoelectric heating. And you put that in as best you can each time you have a star. And finally, I want to emphasize, as I was just hinting at in my response to, to Joe, it's critical in these simulations, and I'll come back to this point in a minute, that you include not just the energy being dumped in, but the momentum. Because momentum can't be instantly radiated away. If my cooling time is infinitely short, the thermal energy just disappears the moment I dump it in. But my, moment, moment, uh, my momentum cannot be just instantly dissipated. It can only be dissipated on an order of galaxy dynamical time, because flows have to cross and shock so they cancel each other out. So when you put all this in, I'll just rerun the movie for a second, you get something like this. This is a simulation of an SMC mass dwarf, uh, and you're looking at the gas, and the blue regions are... Uh, the dense uh, molecular clouds, the pink is neutral gas, and the yellow is the hot, uh, greater than a million Kelvin gas. And what you can see is, you put those physics in, you let your simulation run, and you immediately develop this sort of quasi-steady state, turbulent ISM. When these dense regions collapse, they start forming stars, a few percent of their mass turns into stars, they get shredded by some combination of radiation pressure and warm gas pressure from photoionization, and then when the supernovae go off, which takes a few million years after those stars form, they're going off in a very different region. And the hot gas can escape into these big bubbles that actually are able to break out of the dwarf and vent gas completely out of the galaxy. So what does that look like in a cosmological simulation? So now we're embedding this in a cosmological zoom-in simulation where we cut out a region around one galaxy of interest of a Milky Way mass galaxy in formation. And this is a mock image of the stars and gas. I've changed the color scheme on here, forgive me, but the other one doesn't look pretty in the cosmological case. So, uh, and we're looking at a volume that's about a couple hundred physical kiloparsecs on the side. So big relative to the galaxy at high Z, but about the size of the virial radius at low Z. And what you can see is at high redshift, this thing has a very violent history. Accretion is rapid. Things are merging onto it all the time. But it's also violent from the inside out, not just from the outside in. All these different feedback processes are generating strong winds that blow out 
multi-phase outflows, including molecular gas, ionized gas, hot gas, and seriously affecting the medium around it. And it's not until late times that it finally calms down. Even here at Z below 1, it has a couple of starbursts, and it has one last big blowout. There's a close passage of a companion, triggers a nuclear starburst, and then blows out a bunch of gas, and now it finally settles down and starts to form a steady state, thinner disk. And you can actually see it starts to accrete a more extended ionized gas disk around the central uh, neutral uh, disk, and there's actually a bar in the very center, um, and it you know, starts to look plausibly like a spiral galaxy in the starlight, even after all that violent history. And it sort of putters along until, unfortunately, for purposes of our wanting to analyze a, a disky galaxy, a companion wanders in right at late times to mess up the uh, things. So um, we can see, though, that this has a very dynamic history that's clearly very shaped by feedback. And there's that companion falling right back in at deep zero. Um, so quantitatively, let's look at the question now. Is this sufficient to explain the inefficiency of star formation? Well, let's start with the question of why is star formation inefficient in the instantaneous sense? Why is star formation slow? And I told you that's embodied by the schmidt kennecke relation. So here's all the simulated galaxies from this suite of simulations, taking parameters as is from Starburst 99, and putting them on the schmidt kennecke relation. And the yellow band is just a, a very crude fit to the observations, um, compilation of uh, Genzel and uh, Begil's data. Um, and Pretty remarkably, these things are actually consistent with each other. And that's frankly pretty surprising to me. Because, for example, in these simulations, the assumption about how fast the dense gas turns into stars is that the gas that's above this critical density of 100 particles per cc turns into stars at an efficiency of 100% per dynamical time. And if I turn off feedback, I get out what I put in, and I get that everything turns into stars on a dynamical time. It all cools and collapses very quickly into stars. So what's happening to slow down star formation? Well, it's clear that this is feedback regulated. And here's a more explicit example. These are from non-cosmological simulations, like that SMC I showed you earlier, where we just take an idealized galaxy, and we can do quicker parameter studies, where I again plot the schmidt kennecke relation, black lines of the observed. Here's the no feedback relation. Everything turns into stars on order one dynamical time, 50 times faster than observed. You turn on feedback, and suddenly things drop by a factor of 50. So physically, what's happening? Some of you have seen me make this argument before, and have seen other people make it, but I think it's very important, so I'm going to make it again. Now, if you want to see a detailed version of this, I suggest you check out uh, Raul Shetty's papers, and uh, claude andre frachet Giguere also had a recent paper on this. They very nicely put this argument in more detail, but I'll just Paraphrase it. So is your subgrid model tuned to give you a factor of 50, or uh, does that emerge naturally? That emerges very naturally. And in fact, on my next slide, I'll show you that it's completely independent of the subgrid assumption about star formation. The kennecke schmidt law doesn't actually know anything about how dense gas turns into stars. And that's one of the most exciting conclusions from the simulations. So give me a second to get to that argument, but I'll set it up here. So the idea is that Cooling is efficient, it's fast compared to the dynamical time. So the, ga the gas disk is not supported by thermal pressure, it's supported by the momentum in the bulk flows. It's supported by turbulence, for example. Okay? It's, that's what's stirring up the disk and supporting it against runaway collapse from gravity. Well, that dissipates on order of dynamical time. That's when flows cross, turn around, and dissipate. So, you're dissipating the momentum that's holding up the disk at a rate that's equal to the gas mass times the turbulent velocity, i.e. the gas momentum, divided by the flow crossing or the dynamical time. We can write that equivalently as the gas mass times the velocity dispersion times the orbital frequency of the disk, the one over the dynamical time. All right, so we're dissipating our support. That means we're going to start collapsing under self-gravity as we dissipate the support. We collapse, we collapse more. We collapse, we collapse more. Collapse gets faster and faster as you collapse. Eventually, you're going to form stars as you keep collapsing. And then those stars are going to pump momentum back into the medium from all the mechanisms I just described. Things like radiation pressure, 
uh, photoionization, supernovae, stellar winds, etc., are all going to pump momentum back into the medium. And when that momentum input balances this collapse, then you're going to self-regulate. It's going to balance. So you need the input rate from stars to equal this dissipation rate. Well, what's the input rate from stars? It turns out all of the mechanisms I just described to order of magnitude pump in about the same momentum into the medium. You can check this for yourself. It's obvious for some. I think for supernova, it's sort of a coincidence. But basically, in a time average sense, if you ask what's the momentum input rate from any of those mechanisms, it's one or two times L over C. This is the time average momentum input rate from a normal IMF, from supernovae, from stellar winds, from radiation pressure, etc. So whatever your favorite feedback mechanism is, you're pumping in momentum at a rate that's a few times L over C. In a time average sense, what's L? L is just some number times the star formation rate. So all this is is a number times the star formation rate is the momentum input rate into the medium. And the number is essentially the mass to light conversion efficiency of stars. That's what's setting this pre-factor here, the efficiency of feedback. So now I set these equal to each other. I say you balance when these are equal. What do I get? I get the schmitt relation. This 2% doesn't come from you know, how fast in a vacuum gas should collapse. That's a factor of 50 too fast. This factor of 50 comes from how many stars do I need to hold up a gas disk against runaway collapse? That's what's setting this. And it's ultimately regulated by this efficiency of mass to light conversion in stars. Now, as was just asked, if that's true, if that argument is really true, then the predicted star formation rates on the galaxy average and our predicted schmidt kennicutt relation should be totally independent of what we assume for how the dense gas turns into stars. Because that argument doesn't care about that. That argument only cares about getting enough stars to balance gravity on global scales. It doesn't care how fast the very dense gas is actually making those stars. If the dense gas turns into stars very, very slowly, you'll collapse and collapse and build up more and more and more dense gas until you get the right number of young stars to pump up the medium again. And we can test that explicitly in these simulations. So it's shown here are identical simulations of an idealized Milky Way type galaxy. And you're showing the star formation rate versus time in each run. There's some artifact of the initial conditions at the very beginning where it rises. But then it saturates this equilibrium star formation rate, feedbacks balancing gravity. And in all cases, all of the physics initial conditions are identical, except we change this rule that we have to put in, because we have finite resolution, for how fast the dense gas turns into stars. And we can change this number by orders of magnitude. So on the left, I change the normalization of that rule by a factor of uh, 20 here, but we've actually done a factor of about 400 variation in that. I can change its functional dependence on density. I can change on the right the density threshold above which gas is allowed to turn into stars. None of it matters. If I make star formation on small scales harder, I just pile up more gas on small scales until I get the right number of stars. But you saw that the kennicutt schmidt relation you predict does depend on feedback. In other words, the schmidt kennicutt relation is not telling us about how stars as stars actually form. It's telling us about feedback. It's set by the star formation rate. It's set by the mass in young stars that you need to balance gravity and maintain stability, which is a very different way of thinking about it than I think a lot of people are used to. All right. So I'd argue that the, the you know, efficiency all comes into some order unity term right in front of that L over C. Right? There's some coupling efficiency, what fraction of the feedback actually couples. So yeah, you could get some you know, factor of a few correction. And that would come into you know, either scattering the schmidt kennicutt relation, or maybe there's a, it's not exactly the slope that that relation predicts. It's still going to be pretty close, given the observed scatter of a factor of a few in the relation. Uh, and in fact, in Claude's paper, they do have some explicit uh, predictions for, you know, as you increase or decrease gas fractions, how this might affect the sort of second order scaling, so residuals from the simplest scaling. Um, so there will be some second order corrections there, but they're going to be small compared to the sort of zeroth order version of the law. All right, so I just spent a lot of time on the schmidt kennicutt relation and why star formation is slow in an instantaneous sense. Now I want to jump to this question of star formation being slow 
in an integrated sense over the history of the universe. And this comes down to the question of you know, accretion onto galaxies versus outflows from those galaxies. So are there outflows once you put on all this, uh, once you put in all this feedback physics? Of course, you saw that already. This is just another illustration. This is showing the temperature of the IGM in a simulation with no feedback and feedback. Again, a couple hundred kiloparsecs on the side with a Milky Way mass galaxy forming at the middle of it. Okay, not surprisingly, with no feedback, there's not much action in the IGM. You get some heating up to sort of 10 to the 5 Kelvin as virial shocks develop around these two bigger halos in the box, but it's not that dramatic. Of course, you put on feedback, you get these big galactic winds that do a lot of interesting things to the IGM. And there's a lot of interesting predictions you can make following that, and a lot of interesting things we can try and extract. So Sasha Muratov at UCSD has been analyzing the properties of these galactic winds as they escape galaxies and escape the halos, and asking questions like, what's the mass loading of the winds in different phases of material? How far do they get? How uh, much energy do they put into the medium, etc.? cetera? Um, and I think that work's gonna be extremely useful, especially for people doing large volume cosmological simulations or simu semi-analytic models, where you can't resolve the generation of the winds, so you want numbers like, you know, what's the mass loading of the wind? What's the rate of outflow relative to star formation? And you can try and extract that from these simulations. So this is some preliminary results showing the outflow rate relative to star formation, the mass loading of the winds, as a function of halo mass in these cosmological simulations. There's a trend with mass, albeit with a lot of scattered, but it has the sense that you might expect, certainly if you've worked on this problem, where massive galaxies have relatively modest winds relative to their star formation rate, uh, sort of comparable. But in dwarfs, you can get these really high outflow rates. You can get wind outflow rates that are tens or even a hundred times the star formation rate getting blown out of these galaxies. Yeah, so every one of these is a cosmological simulation, averaged over, I think, some redshift interval from z of 3 to 2. Um, there's a lot of time averaging to make the relation with this clean. It's incredibly noisy if you plotted it instantaneously, as you might expect. Uh, a lot of people want to boil this down into some simple you know, power law scaling. Uh, Sasha's sort of attempted to do that here. Uh, I don't like making it quite that simple, but uh, if you want to take away about whether winds scale as circular velocity to the minus two or the minus one, the answer is somewhere in between, depending on what mass they live at. Uh, but I think we'll have some more reasonable answers that account for not just the mean scaling, but actually the scatter in this relationship shortly. To me, more interesting than just how much material gets out, though, is the question of what physics is driving this, uh, both in terms of what physics is most important for different galaxies, and also trying to get at the question of why this has been so hard to see in previous work. Why is this such a challenge? Mm -hmm. So Sasha's been doing this at a wide range of radii, because of course for different purposes you care about different things. And most of it is in some kind of fountain, so it comes back. So this is actually a very important element to the question. I'd say the qualitative scaling there isn't so dependent on where you measure it. The normalization is. I, I honestly don't remember where. I think he was measuring it a tenth of your real radius there for that particular plot. But, but yeah, he's looking at exactly this question because it's, it's in detail very important to, to say where you measure. So, all right, what about the physics that drives this? Well, here's some idealized experiments again that help us get some intuition for what's happening here. So I'm plotting the wind outflow rate relative to the mass in stars formed in these simulations. These are again non-cosmological simulations where I'm going back to my idealized one galaxy at a time simulation just so I can play with knobs a little more and see how different physics affect the outcome. And I've modeled different galaxies here. So the top left is some very gas-rich starburst galaxy. The bottom right is that small Magellanic cloud analog that I showed you the movie of. The bottom left is a Milky Way analog and the top right some kind of M82 type analog. Okay, so you turn feedback on, these all have some outflows, that's not surprising. You turn feedback off entirely, there's no outflows. Not surprising. But what happens if I turn off one piece of the physics? Well, let's say I turn off radiation pressure. Well, in the Milky Way and the small Magellanic Cloud, I turn off radiation pressure, it's not a disaster. My winds are weaker, but it's not terrible, and that's not surprising. Those galaxies aren't forming stars at a very high rate. There's not a lot of radiation pressure to begin with. They don't have super high opacities. A lot of what there is is leaking out. And there's other mechanisms that could easily be just as efficient, like photoionization 
contain. In my super starburst galaxy, which I've initialized to have some crazy star formation rate of a couple hundred solar masses a year, this has a big effect. But I again shouldn't be surprised. This is an incredibly dusty, massive galaxy that's essentially designed to be at the Eddington limit for a starburst. So if it's Eddington limited, radiation pressure is important. It's not surprising. All right, what happens if instead I turn off supernovae or stellar winds being able to heat the IGM? Well, it doesn't make such a huge difference for this super starburst, not surprisingly, uh, because they've got these other mechanisms like radiation pressure that can do a lot there. But when I turn it off in the Milky Way or the Small Magellanic Cloud, I see my winds just bottom out. I'm no longer generating these big hot bubbles that generate columns and break out of the disk, because I've lost my biggest energy source. So qualitatively, I think this all makes sense. Quantitatively, though, there's an interesting point I want to emphasize here, which is a lot of our experiments, we try and build up intuition, so we take these pieces apart one at a time. We say, I'm going to do a simulation of supernovae. I'm going to do a simulation of stellar winds, a simulation of radiation pressure. The problem is, if you assume naively that those things are independent, you can somehow just stack their effects to get the integrated effect of all these feedback mechanisms on galactic winds. They're going to be badly wrong, because there are very strong nonlinear interactions between these mechanisms. So for example, uh, this blue line and this red line, I kept everything else on feedback-wise and just turned off one mechanism, either radiation pressure or supernovae. So those two lines, if these mechanisms were actually separable, should sum to significantly more than the black line. And they don't. They sum to less. Just saying that it's nonlinear. What's happening are things like, you need radiation pressure to tear apart GMCs so that when the supernovae go off, they go off in a pre-processed environment. They get out more easily to low density regions that can be more efficiently heated. And these nonlinear interactions are really important for generating large winds. So I say this to point this out. I point this out in particular because, again, many simulations are focused on one mechanism at a time. And I think that's just not, unfortunately, going to get you most of the way on this problem. Yep? How sensitive is this for a solution? I mean, in particular, radiation pressure, yep. I blow my radiation into a routine in the effective plant. Yes. Uh, so you see the winds converge certainly more slowly than the star formation rate in these simulations if you just do sort of brute force resolution studies. Um, that said, the variations aren't huge. And I think, so for example, for the winds, I, I'd say what's most important for the radiation pressure is the single scattering radiation pressure. Uh, the IR radiation pressure we're absolutely not resolving well. Uh, but we're sort of saved by, frankly, the fact that we're not resolving such high densities where you need the IR radiation pressure to, to tear the medium apart. That's a little worrisome, but that's my answer there, and I completely agree that that is resolution dependent. Um, uh, all I can say is, you know, given that sort of counteracting effect, it doesn't seem to have a orders of magnitude effect. It has a factor of two effect when we go from sort of our low resolution to highest resolution runs. But... I would say absolutely because of, precisely because of this nonlinearity, you should take the absolute numbers here with a little bit of a grain of salt. Because um, there's also just physics that are not in here. Magnetic fields, conduction, that are going to change things comparably. But that said, let's compare to observations anyways, because this is what we have. So this is the mass of these galaxies at z of zero, compared to the observed relation between stellar mass and halo mass, this inefficiency of star formation. So stellar mass, halo mass, the dotted line is what you get if all the baryons turned into stars. These colored lines show the observational constraints from work by uh, Moster and Beruzzi. And it's, again, pretty shocking to me that things are even remotely close to the observations, given that there's no fine-tuning in these models. They haven't been rerun with parameters adjusted to get this relation right. And I can say that honestly as somebody who has rerun with parameters adjusted many models to get certain relations right, where we just had free parameters in the models that we were trying to uh, constrain. The fact that the sort of most naive thing you would do, where you put in everything for a group IMF out of Starburst 99, actually plausibly gets you reasonable outflow rates that you live anywhere near this relation, I think is actually very encouraging that we're starting to get close to the most important physics here. And you can see that pretty dramatically uh, when you start, again, playing with turning on and off different physics, how these interactions are really important. 
So just this is just plotting the same information, just in a different way. Here I've divided out the halo mass. So it's just the fraction of baryons in stars as a function of halo mass. And these simulations turn on and off different feedback mechanisms. Play the same game in the cosmological simulations that I just showed you for the isolated galaxies. And so, for example, for the dwarfs, this blue point is our run where all the physics are on. So you can look at this cluster of points. If I turn off stellar winds alone, it's not a disaster. A lot of the thermal energy is still being dumped in by supernovae. Momentum is still being dumped in by radiation pressure and photoionization. Also, because the GMCs themselves are quite small and have low binding velocities, if you turn off either radiation pressure or photoionization individually, the other mechanism will still destroy the GMCs in a relatively quick time after stars start forming. So either one of those turned off alone isn't a disaster for a dwarf galaxy. But if you turn off, say, both radiation pressure and photoionization, then these clouds don't have a good way to get disrupted before the supernovae go off. And the supernovae end up going off in this very dense gas. They stir up the turbulence, but they're not able to generate these big galactic winds. And you find that you turn most of your baryons into stars. Or if you just say there's no supernovae, you equivalently don't generate big winds and turn most of your gas into stars. So you really see this interplay happening here. All right, I'll skip this. This is just a comparison to some historical simulations. But now I want to preview some of the work in progress from these simulations, because there's a lot of cool things coming out on this. What I've described so far is in a paper that's actually already out, but there's a lot of cool results that, that I think will be out very soon that I want to give you uh, a preview of, and you'll have to forgive me if I gloss over some of them because it works in progress. So you might ask, okay, maybe the mass has come out reasonably, but what about galaxy morphologies? And in particular, there have been strong claims by some people in this field that it is impossible to have strong feedback and have a, thick, a thin galactic disk, or have galactic disks at all, because these big outflows are just going to destroy the disk. And this is that same movie, and they certainly are doing a good job of destroying any regular disk structure at early times. But I show this example from work by Freke van der Voort of a galaxy at z of zero, Milky Way mass, uh, and not a crazy unusual one, relatively typical one. In fact, it was chosen to have a slightly violent history. Um, that forms a beautiful thin disk at late times. And the key is something similar to what you're seeing in this movie, that at late times there's this transition. At early times, the inflow's very rapid, there's a lot of merging, there's a lot of accretion, the gas fractions are super high, so the genes mass is a large fraction of the galaxy mass, so the disk is inherently very unstable. But as accretion rates slow down, you undergo this transition, you build up a more extended disk, the genes mass relative to the galaxy drops, so it becomes more stable. Uh, you get more like small molecular cloud type structure along the disk. And yes, you're still blowing an outflow here, but now once it's built up that thin disk, the outflow just takes the path of least resistance and vents out into the halo. And you get something like this. And this is a quantitative description. This is the distribution for the stars of their circular per, uh, circularity parameter, basically the ratio of their angular momentum to that if they were on a perfectly circular orbit co-aligned with the, the disk. You get this very disk-dominated, nice, thin system. So it's at least possible. I am not standing here trying to tell you that thin disks is a solved problem. We have one simulation that has strong feedback, has a reasonable stellar mass. This one I showed on the previous plot. It lives on the galaxy mass-halo mass relation and has a thin disk. But this is an area where it's much more sensitive to the details of feedback, as well as to just tiny perturbations to the galaxy history. So this is the one I just showed. If I make a, a small, physically plausible change, let's say I don't believe that infrared photons can multiply scatter, that they all break out, and I'm just not resolving their breakout. Then I rerun the simulation, I get this one on the right, much thicker disk, much more compact bulge, because it's not quite as efficient at blowing out the dense gas that got to the very center. Even though the stellar masses of these two runs are almost perfectly identical, there is a big change in their quantitative morphologies. So I'm not at all trying to tell you that morphology is a solved problem, but I do want to counter the statement that it's impossible somehow to have simultaneously strong feedback in thin disks. And here's just quantitatively showing the range of parameters you get. These are all just variations to the model that are physically plausible but within the sort of range of the uncertainties of how we put the physics. You can see, quantitatively, there's a big difference in bulge to disk ratios. 
All of these are pretty risky, though. The blue line is what we get if we run this run with no feedback. Then all the stars form super early. It grows by merging, basically, at late times, and it's a total bulge. So there is a difference, but the details, of course, are still uncertain. Now, other work that's in progress is focused on things like uh, why we, what differences might emerge from these explicitly resolved uh, galactic winds uh, versus what we've done in the past. So, in particular, Claude Fauché, Jaguar, and Duchamp Curis have been doing a lot of work trying to study how this compares to previous simulations. So here's showing the same box of the IGM on the right with all the explicit uh, feedback that I just described. On the left, using this old subgrid model that we had used in a lot of our simulations, but you still have to use in large volume simulations like the illustrious or the eagle simulations or that you still have to use in some analytic models. You can see the structure of the IGM is different between these two simulations. This is, sorry, 200 physical kiloparsecs on the side. Uh, and that shouldn't be surprising. I mean, you can see the dynamics of the winds are different, right? That simple assumption that the outflow rate is always proportional to the star formation rate isn't really true in detail. The star formation rate is highly variable. The outflow rates are highly variable. And you see that in the star formation histories. So this is the star formation histories of these galaxies. The red line shows what happens with no feedback. The blue and green lines are simple toy model semi-analytic outflow prescriptions. And the black line is from these new simulations. And of course, the biggest change is not just that it's suppressed, but that it's much more highly variable, which makes sense. There's a lot of structure in the ISM. Things are you know, bursting, and the individual star clusters are forming, et cetera. And the shape of the star formation history is different. So there are areas where we can probably do a lot more than the existing approximations, where we might be able to capture additional processes that are important, not just inside of galaxies, but for the CGM and IGM by recognizing that these things are dynamic, that they're multi-phase, et cetera. So for example, Claude's done some preliminary comparison with uh, the distribution of absorbers in the CGM and IGM. And it's very clear that that does care about how you treat galactic winds, in particular the fact that galactic winds are multi-phase. And Joe pointed out nicely at this meeting that this is still an area where you really have to be concerned about a lot of resolution issues. So again, don't take this as the final word. but I think the more important point to highlight is that this is an area where it really does matter how you do galactic winds, not just that you do galactic winds. And this is just another illustration of that. Um, here's another area where this really matters. So Jose Anorbe here has been looking at the question of how feedback affects the structure and dark matter content of dwarf galaxies. So this is that same star formation plot. I show it just to emphasize again, star formation histories are very bursty. This is a simulation of a low mass dwarf, 10 to the 10 solar mass halo. You can see that burstiness launching gas out of the halo. It's about 50 kiloparsecs on the side. And this is the dwarf at z of zero uh, in the starlight. And that burstiness is something that increasingly has been mapped out in the observations as well. This is work by Dan Weitz mapping out the star formation history of local group dwarfs. And you really see a huge diversity in their star formation histories. And I think that's important for things like their internal structure. So there's been a lot of discussion in the literature about the idea, for example, that the dark matter cusps, the NFW profile extrapolated into the center of dwarf galaxies, can be modified. If you have inflows slowly falling in, and then these rapid expulsions of gas, you dynamically perturb the dark matter orbits, and over time you can essentially puff up this cusp into a core in the center of the galaxy. And explain some observations, maybe by baryonic physics rather than uh, new dark matter physics. So Jose has been quantitatively looking at this, and this is just one example. So the black, run, the black line here shows the dark matter mass profile of this dwarf when we run a dark matter only simulation. And then the red lines show two different uh, realizations of this simulation where we, again, just tweaked within sort of plausible physical uncertainties uh, the exact details of how feedback occurs. And you can see it's quite possible to form an extended core out to a kiloparsec in this system. Interestingly, it's not that you always form massive cores. And I think one of the most exciting results from Jose's work 
is that there's actually a strong correlation between the presence or absence or strength of these cores and the shape of the star formation histories of these dwarfs. So the systems that have weak cores, like this dashed line, have early star formation histories with less sort of extended star formation. The systems with strong cores maintain very strong extended star formation histories. And what's happening, we think, is that the cores are forming slowly over time. Each burst just does a little bit of perturbation, and you really need to keep doing this over and over and over and over again, over a Hubble time, to get these big extended cores. So I think the exciting aspect of that is that that presents a real uh, uh, test that we can look at observationally, that if it is baryonic physics and not exotic dark matter physics driving the transformation of cusps in the cores, we can ask whether there is such a correlation between the dark matter structure and the star formation histories, or whether we need to invoke some very different physics to explain this. Uh, in closely related work, T.K. Chan, a grad student at UCSD, is looking at this across a wide mass range. Another prediction that emerges fairly robustly is that these cores are only able to form over a sort of sweet spot range in uh, galaxy mass. So I don't want to get into the details of this plot. It's essentially some parameterization of how flat the slope of the mass profile is in the inner parts of the halo at z of 0 and at z of 1. Higher value is more core. That's all you really need to know. What you can see is there's a sweet spot in mass, in halo mass. It corresponds to galaxy stellar masses between 10 to the 6 and maybe 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 9 solar masses. The problem is much higher mass systems have turned too many of their baryons into stars at their center, and that's pulling back on the dark matter. Much lower mass systems just don't have enough energy, as nicely pointed out by paper by Shea Garrison Kimmel, who's a collaborator on this. There's just not enough energy to sustain these repeated outbursts that would actually perturb the dark matter uh, that much. You can look at a lot of other properties of dwarfs. So Bose and Mike Bowen Colchin have looked at things like, for example, their kinematics. So this is a, just the relation between their dynamical mass and their radii, observed local group dwarfs and the simulations. And we don't have a quantitative answer yet to tell you, but uh, we're very interested in this, of course, for things like, uh, those of you who are familiar know this plot is representing one form of the too big to fail problem, basically the, another representation of the idea that dark matter halos might be too dense in their centers. There's other effects that seem to depend on feedback as well. So Jose has looked at this. I've got a student, Lena Merchikova, who's looking at the mass-metallicity relation of galaxies. Uh, she's been looking at high masses, Jose at low masses. And this is just mass metallicity relation of some of the simulations and observations. OK, they agree plausibly well. Is that interesting? Well, I think it is because at low masses, that's another area where this differs between how you implement your feedback. So these simulations seem to lie at least order of magnitude consistent with the observed mass metallicity relation down to very low masses. If you take a sort of simple analytic or semi-analytic model, though, so, for example, there were a couple of papers talking about this from the illustrious simulations. Uh, uh, Ramil Debay had a paper about this from these bathtub models, as he calls it. Uh, and, and people from the semi-analytic community, Rachel Somerville, had pointed this out in a number of her models. If you take the simplest model, where you assume that all the baryons in a halo accrete onto the galaxy are well mixed, and then all the ones that we don't see got blown out, then you can predict straightforward from that the galaxy metallicity. And what you get when you do that exercise is an underprediction of the metallicities that we actually observe in dwarfs. The problem is that the dwarfs seem to have blown out, according to that argument, 99% of their baryons, and yet retained 10 or 20% of all the metals that were ever produced by the stars we see in those dwarfs. So somehow, metals are sticking around while other material is either getting blown out or not getting in in the first place. So again, this is all preliminary, and we don't have a, an answer to you for you about why this is happening yet. But I think this just highlights one of these areas where there's really interesting food for thought and areas to explore. This is a little more exotic, but I want to advertise it just because the paper should be out in a couple weeks. Frank of Endeavor has also been looking uh, at whether or not you can use these simulations to constrain the origin of our process elements by assuming all sorts of different models for whether neutron star mergers or other uh, processes produce them and comparing it to abundance distributions in the Milky Way. That's something you can do with, of course, high resolution simulations that uh, is just not possible at, at lower resolution. Um, the punchline is maybe. Uh, so 
I'm at the end of my time, and so I'm not really going to be able to talk about uh, the other side of this equation, which is the very massive galaxies and AGN feedback. But I do just want to hit a couple of very quick points. So one is that, while I've tried to emphasize some areas where these simulations do quite well, this movie, there we go, uh, it's certainly not the case that all the observations agree with these simulations. And there's a lot of areas of discrepancy that we're trying to look at and understand what that's telling us about new physics. But one that's very obvious is there is no central galaxy in these simulations that quenches. We just had a conference here, so those of you who were at the conference saw me give a whole talk about this, which is why I'm not going to spend so much time on this right now. But satellites in these simulations can get stripped and shut off their star formation. But the massive galaxies at the center of their own halos, in massive halos, never stop forming stars. And this is one example of a massive halo. And these dotted lines are the observational constraints of what we think galaxies in those halos should look like in their star formation histories. And what we see, the black line is our simulation. As the halo grows, the star formation rate grows. OK, the agreement's not great, but it's plausible. But wait, it doesn't turn over. Wait, it doesn't turn over. It just keeps going up all the way to z of 0. Gas keeps cooling. We have a runaway cooling flow problem. And we end up with a galaxy that's completely blue and star forming at late times. And all the physics that I've listed here should be treated in these simulations to some extent or another, uh, with the caveat that the MHD treatment has just been something we've been experimenting with. But this isn't the regime where we expect that uh, conduction alone is going to solve this problem. I'm happy to talk more about that if you don't mind. We talked about it at this meeting. But the point is the physics that we have in here, gravity, stellar feedback, et cetera, is not enough. So, my natural inclination, those of you who know me, know that I've worked a lot on AGN feedback. So my inclination is to say that it's AGN, but I don't know that. Um, and just going to, sorry, that was my, I used to have a little button that would just skip the AGN section. But, um, but I don't know that yet, and that's something that we're very interested in looking at uh, over the next couple of years. The real goal is to try and uh, bring some of the AGN physics and its treatment in these kinds of simulations up to at least, you know, crudely a similar level to how we've started to be able to treat some of the stellar feedback physics. And I think that's going to enable a similar range of interesting questions for the massive galaxy population. But all I'll say right now that I can say robustly is that the physics of stellar feedback alone is not enough to explain the massive galaxy population. So with that, I'll leave with my conclusions, and thank you again very much for having me. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. Um, let's first make some light. Ah, the movies are my supposed to be. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Sky background. At least, ruining, you, uh, at least you can see who you're talking to. I'll move over here so they I can the feedback. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about feedback, yes. Um, so, and is there any feedback from the audience? Any further questions? Um, you said um, your models are getting to a point that we're becoming predictive now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we've actually had a debate internal in the group about whether we predict a very large scatter or a very small scatter at low masses, uh, which I think comes from whether you're talking to people who come from the dwarf side or come from the massive galaxy side. Uh, what we decided is, so I, I'm going to cop out and not give you an answer quite yet. And the reason is, you know, the, the scatter that you're seeing there is mostly, you know, I'll, I'll pull up the plot. The, it's mostly dominant. The, the, the plot that you're seeing is not that many simulations, is the issue. So you see a bunch of galaxies down there, OK? We don't have, when I made this plot, we didn't have that many independent zoom in simulations. These galaxies are satellites of bigger galaxies, OK? So they're not as well resolved. 
So what we really want to do is run a large suite and of different zoom-ins with different conditions, sort of random sampling of a population. And that's happening right now. So Andrew Wetzel just made a suite of like 20 different initial conditions of dwarfs in this mass range that were sort of randomly selected from uh, bigger cosmological boxes, and we're setting all those off right now. So I think we'll have the statistics to actually answer that question uh, very near term. So ask me, make sure you get an answer from me before there's an observational answer, and I think we can give you an answer to that relatively quickly. But basically, the big open points here are the main galaxy in each zoom-in simulation, so those are the ones you should really trust. The other ones, it's kind of neat that they land in the same relation, but they're not as well resolved, and I, I don't want to make a strong conclusion based on them. I think you're right. The other is that even as it, it was not only luck, but it was you know, real insight, whatever, you got just the right um, impact of by <coughs> your particular situation, and it's still relying on a particular selection of feedback processes, right? And mm -hmm. you've also shown that if you disable some of those, you get yeah. a qualitatively different outcome, mm -hmm. and you don't have all of the data, you know, yeah. but there are magnetic fields, there might be constant rays, mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. So I think, yeah, you're right. Uh, that is, those are both caveats that everybody should, should take away from this. Um, and I don't, you know, it's easy to oversell, and I, I, I'm sorry if I'm doing that. Uh, uh, I do want to say, so we have, uh, because precisely we're, we're, I think we have the same concerns, we've tried to look at this to some extent. So for example, here, I'm plotting this fraction of the baryons that have gone into stars as a function of mass against a bunch of numerical choices. These are both sort of pure numerical choices, like how you solve the hydro equations, what flavor of SPH you use, uh, but also completely plausible physical choices about the you know, subgrid treatment of things, like what's the critical density above which we allow star formation. There's other experiments we've done too that aren't plotted on here, but have similar scatter, like how do we actually algorithmically couple the feedback to the neighboring particles in the code. And those actually create significant scatter. I mean, you should take away, you know, there's factors of three bouncing around in here. So absolutely, this is still, that, that first caveat of yours is still a concern. I don't think it's, you know, the orders of magnitude gap we see between the no feedback and the feedback simulations. What makes me more worried there is your second caveat. I completely agree. Because this is nonlinear and we don't have all the physics in, what makes us feel like things won't radically go away from this when we add in another piece of physics. And I don't know that they won't. Uh, you know, we're trying to do some work, and we've, I know, I've talked to you a little about this. We've done some very preliminary experiments with MHD implementations. Uh, there's numerical issues with that, which is one of the reasons we haven't pushed as hard on it, uh, because I think we might need to solve more deep numerical problems to do the MHD right. That said, when we just put an MHD, it didn't change this answer qualitatively. It sort of made factor of two level differences uh, uh, again. And the cosmic ray question is one that I'm very interested in trying to call more faithfully. I was talking with Christoph a lot about this. Uh, uh, and it's on the to-do list, is basically what I can say. Yeah. Further questions? <laughs>
So the answer is I don't know. We haven't done a, any comparison of this. That's a good idea. And, uh, the student of mine, Lena Rojkova, would be somebody who could probably answer this relatively quickly. Because she's been measuring things like how much hot gas is inside the virial radius, what its temperature distribution is, etc. So I'm sure she could make this prediction. Uh, I think, as you alluded to, a lot of the constraints are for elliptical galaxies which is something we've just started to push the simulations up to. And there, as I said, all the simulations have a cooling flow problem. So my guess would be that we're probably not overproducing the X-ray luminosities because it seems like we're underheating the halos. But that's a very naive statement for me to make. So, so yeah, that's a very good experiment. We should just do it. Any further questions? Any further questions? If not, then I would like to say let's thank Phil again. Thank you.